السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا ربنا بما علمتنا وزدنا من كرمك علما يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم طهر قلوبنا وأزل عيوبنا وتولنا بالحسنى وزينا بالتقوى واجمع لنا خيري الآخرة والأولى وارزقنا طاعتك ما أبقيتنا يا رحمن يا رحيم اللهم أخرجنا من ظلمات الوهم وأكرمنا بنور الفهم وعلمنا بالحلم وزينا بالعلم وجعلنا من الذين يستمعون القول فيتبعون أحسنه يا ذا الجلال والإكرام اللهم افتح علينا فتوح العارفين ووفقنا توفيق الصالحين وجعلنا من المتقربين إليك على علم وهدى وبصيرة يا فتاح يا عليم وصل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا وحبيبنا ونبينا وقدوتنا ونور قلوبنا محمد بن عبد الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أمين الحمد لله بيد النعمة رب الله سبحانه وتعالى and his karam and his fadl upon us will continue with the 40 hadith of Imam al-Nawawi rahimahullahu subhanahu wa ta'ala wa nafa'ana bih we are on the 24th hadith and Imam al-Nawawi rahimahullahu ta'ala narrates through an unbroken chain to Abu Darda uh, sorry to Abu Dhar al-Ghifari radiyallahu ta'ala anhu ardah عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فيما يروي عن الله سبحانه وتعالى. So Abu Dhar al-Ghifari narrated that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم reported that Allah سبحانه وتعالى said يا عبادي my servants إني حرمت ظلم على نفسي وجعلته بينكم محرما فلا تظلموا. That Allah سبحانه وتعالى informed people that zulm to be unjust is impossible for him, it's mustahil aqlan according to majority of the mutakallimun, it is rationally impossible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be unjust or to, to do zulm which means to dispose of the affairs of others or to have any interaction with the property of others without their permission it is impossible because everything belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and therefore he cannot do anything with the property of someone else because everything belongs to him or zulm means linguistically to put something uh, in other than its place or to use something for other than its purpose which is also impossible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala since he determines the place and the purpose for everything so his doing of anything is the indication of what that thing is for and what is to be done with it or where it is to be placed some of the mutakallimun say that dhulm is possible rationally for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this hadith informs us that though it is rationally possible, Allah Azza wa Jal will never do it. That's a minority opinion that is very problematic. And then Allah Azza wa Jal says to people, so all of you, and I've made it haram for you, I've made the dhulm haram for you, so do not do dhulm. The highest form of dhulm we said is shirk. Because it is the usage of life for other than its purpose. It is the placing of something in other than its place. It is to place others in the place of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To place Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in other than his place. And to use the capacity of man to worship and to revere a being that is higher than themselves. It is to give that, is to use that capacity to revere and to worship other than Allah azza wa jalla. The Qur'an uses the word dhulm to mean shirk in majority of the usages of the word dhulm in the Qur'an. 
and the description Zalimun, people of oppression or oppressors, that description is used in the Quran majority of times to refer to the people of shirk. Shirk is the greatest oppression. It is an oppression to the self of a person and it is oppression to the world because there is an impact for shirk in the alam al-malakut, in the spiritual realm and it is felt. And then after that is kufr, shirk and kufr. Kufr may not involve shirk. Kufr might be mistaken to say people claim to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but say things that are not supposed to be said about Allah azza wa So this can be kufr. So kufr is also dhulm. And then ma'asiyah, normal sins, sins of the body because it is the usage of the body for other than its purpose. It's to use the intellect in a way that is not meant to be used. It is using the hands and the feet and the eyes and the ears, the tongue, the stomach and the private parts in ways that they were not meant to be used. And so therefore this is an abuse of the body and it is called zulm. So when Allah, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam reported that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala said وَجَعَلْتُهُ بَيْنَكُمْ مُحَرَّمًا All of these are included in that statement. Allah has made shirk haram for you and kufr haram for you and ma'asiyah haram for you. So O oh, you who believe, do not يعني فلا تظلموا or لا تظلموا So do not be unjust to one another or to yourselves. And then the hadith continued, he said, Ya ibadi, O my servants. Again, this will be repeated over and over. One, to grab the attention of the listener and two, to give shafaqa, yani to give a sense of compassion, a sense of warmth, that the kind of warmth that is given from a teacher to a student or from a parent to a child, from a mentor to a, somebody who is seeking that mentorship. It is to show connection. So Allah Azza wa is saying, Ya ibadi. Like how somebody would say, Oh my child. To show uh, affection. And to grab the attention of the listener. Ya ibadi. Oh my servants. Kullukum dalun. إِلَّا مَنْ هَدَيْتُهُ فَاسْتَهْدُونِي أَهْدِكُمْ All of you are misguided except those whom I have guided. So seek my guidance. And we spoke about that in the previous session. Then it continued. يَا عِبَادِي O oh my servants, كُلُّكُمْ جَائِعٌ إِلَّا مَنْ أَطْعَمْتُهُ فَاسْتَطْعِمُونِي أُطْعِمْكُمْ O oh my servants, all of you are hungry except those whom I have fed. In other words, None of you would receive any rizq if it is not for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding people that everything comes from Him. Every grain of food that you eat is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything that you drink is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every bit of money that you have or clothing that you have, it is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And were it not for the rizq of Allah Azza wa you would have nothing. This is just a reminder to people to not think that the regularities in the operation of the world, meaning the things that you see, rainfall, growth of food, people working and earning money and spending and buying and cooking and eating, don't think that all of these regularities are the causal effect of your rizq. These are normative causes. Normative meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made this the norm, the way that things work, but these are not necessities. There's no causal necessity between eating and actually receiving nutrients or between working and getting money and buying food. You can work, you can get the money and sometimes you may not be able to buy the food. All of this depends on the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So do not be fooled by the things that you see because beyond the appearance of the world, there is a reality. And that reality is the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the working of Allah azza wa jal, the ilm of Allah, the qudra of Allah, the irada 
of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, kullukum ja'i'un illa man at'amtuhu. All of you would be foodless except those to whom I have given food. Fastat'imuni. If you understand this, then seek food. Yani seek sustenance from me. This is a command to everybody. Even if you have, if you could look in your cupboards and you can see food, you can see rice, you can see everything. Istat'imuni. Seek it from me. As a reminder that I am the one who gives it. And as a reminder that I am the one who allows you to benefit from it. That food can be a source of sickness for you if it is not the will of Allah Azza wa Jal. You can eat and the body can refuse to send it out and you can become sick because of that. You can eat and the, the, the operations of the body to extract the nutrients and pass out the waste and the nutrients actually being beneficial to the body, that can stop. That is under the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So don't be fooled. Istat'imuni. Seek that from me, ut'imkum, and I will give to you. Also, asking for more is a type of shukr. It's a type of gratitude. And the more you ask, the more you will receive. Wala in shakartum la azidannakum. If you are grateful, I will increase it. Some of the ulama, they say the opposite is also true. If you are not grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then he can decrease your rizq. He can take away from you what he has given to you because of your ingratitude. So, فَاسْتَطْعِمُونِي أُطْعِمْكُمْ Then it continued, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, يَا عِبَادِي O oh my servants, كُلُّكُمْ عَارٍ إِلَّا مَنْ كَسَوْتُهُ All of you are naked except those whom I have clothed. Same principle. فَاسْتَكْسُونِي So if you ask, ask of me. Even whatever you want. There's a narration that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to Musa alayhi salatu wasalam that if you want a sandal strap then ask Allah, make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fastaksuni, so seek that from me, aksukum, and I will give that to you. The ulama of tasawwuf, they interpret this sentence in a esoteric way, or because this is the way, this is how they read the nusus. Where uh, إِلَّا مَنْ كَسَوْتُهُ kiswa, According to them in this hadith Qudsi refers to taqwa. Because clothing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَلِبَاسُ التَّقْوَى ذَلِكَ خَيْرٍ The clothing of taqwa, that is best. So according to the ulama of tasawwuf, كُلُّكُمْ عَارٍ means all of you have or none of you would have any spiritual state. None of you will have any taqwa. None of you will be able to worship me. None of you will be able to have khashya and reverence and awe for me. Illa man kasawtuhu. Except those to whom I have given the clothing of taqwa. Fastaksuni. So seek that from me aksikum. And I will give you more. Which is a, one of the major principles of tasawwuf. Is that whenever we do any amal, any good deed, so even the wajibat, the spiritual reward of that has to be 100% depended on, yani we depend on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 100% for that benefit. Anytime we think my prayer, yani I prayed and therefore my prayer will get me something, this will take away from the spiritual benefits of the prayer. Because now you're depending on your self to come close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not depending on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you do what you have to do. And then after that you hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you a reward for it or brings you near to Him because of it. But you're not depending on yourself because in order to reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we must humble the self. The self, the more we can make it small, 
the bigger Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala becomes in the heart. The more distance we can create from ourselves, meaning from the ego that we have, the closer we can come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But to think that I am doing something and therefore what I do can bring me near to Allah is aggrandizing the self and making Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of lesser importance to the self. And so you're actually moving more away or further away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than you are moving closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the meaning of the sentence is kullukum arin. Everybody is born and they're yani they not you become mature and you start your journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you start that journey naked in terms of your spiritual states. Kullukum ar illa man kasawtu and then whatever taqwa you have is what you've been given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, istaksuni, if you want more taqwa, seek that from Allah aksikum. And Allah azza wa will give you more from the clothing of taqwa. Walibasu taqwa, thalika khair. And the clothing of taqwa, that is best. And then it continued, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Ya ibadi innakum tukhti'una bil layli wan nahar O my servants you tukhti'un you commit mistakes if we observe the other sentences before the previous ones the first one it says kullukum dalun all of you are an dalala and kullukum ja'i'un all of you are hungry وَكُلُّكُمْ عَارٍ And all of you are naked. And then it says, إِنَّكُمْ تُخْطِئُونَ Instead of كُلُّكُمْ تُخْطِئُونَ Here, إِنَّكُمْ تُخْطِئُونَ Instead of كُلُّكُمْ All of you is to exclude the Anbiya. We can use words like كُلُّكُمْ ضَالٌ For the Anbiya, but it has a specific meaning. And this is also used in the Qur'an in Surah Al-Duha. And the ulama differ in the meaning there, but it could be used. But there is a difference of opinion concerning the akhta. Can the anbiya commit sins? And tukhti'oon with a dhamma, this is the mashhur of the hadith. Instead of takhta'oon. And the difference is that the original verb for tukhti'oon would be akhta'a. And the original verb of takhti'oon will be khata'a. Khata'a means to make mistakes without, without intending them. Yani absent-mindedly making a mistake is called, some you say khata'a. He made a mistake. But if you say somebody akhta'a means they purposely made a mistake. They purposely did something wrong. And the ulama agree, yani ulama of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, that the anbiya do not commit purposeful mistakes. There is a difference of opinion concerning mistakes that were done absent-mindedly. But purposefully doing something wrong the ulama are in agreement of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah that this is not possible. And so, innakum, meaning other than the anbiya, tukhti'oon, you would make purposeful mistakes. In other words, nobody, even the awliya, the mu'tamad among the ulama, is even the awliya will commit sins. In fact, even the awliya will commit major sins. So, tukhti'oon, everybody will make mistakes. Because Allah Azza wa Jal created us weak and He wants us to make mistakes. So that we can make tawbah. Because tawbah is something that is beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that if we do not commit sins, Allah would replace you with people who will commit sins. So that they can make istighfar and tawbah. So, إِنَّكُمْ تُخْطِئُونَ بِاللَّيْلِ وَالنَّهَارِ You would make mistakes يعني, by night and by day. And he said بِاللَّيْلِ وَالنَّهَارِ 
in the hadith or this hadith Qudsi, it put night before day in this context of sins because people who commit sins would usually try to hide and commit sins in a good society. A society where sins are not prevalent, which is the aim of every Muslim society, people would have to hide to commit sins because openly committing sins is not something that is acceptable in a good society. And the night is more appropriate for that because it's more dark. And if it's not literally during the night, then night represents any hiding because of the darkness of the night as opposed to the brightness of the day. So this is why, according to the ulama, the word night is used here before nahar because it's in the context of committing sins. Innakum tukhti'una bil-layli wa nahar So you commit sins, you will sin at night or, or by day, or by night and by day. In other words, you will always commit sins. وَأَنَا أَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا And I forgive all sins. We know the exception except shirk by ijma' Because of the ayah, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَغْفِرُ أَيْ يُشْرَكَ بِهِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not forgive shirk. Meaning shirk that is not followed by the acceptance of Islam. Because shirk that is followed by the acceptance of Islam is forgiven. وَإِنَّ الْإِسْلَامَ يَجِبُ مَا قَبْلَهَا Islam erases what precedes it. But we're talking about shirk committed by Muslims after Iman or shirk that is not followed up with Iman. This is by the agreement of the ulama. And there is a difference of opinion concerning willful murder. Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu from among the companions it was his opinion that willful murder is an unforgivable sin it's a minority opinion but it exists so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is communicating to people any people and jinns all of you will commit sins but I forgive all sins فَاسْتَغْفِرُونِي أَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ so seek my forgiveness and I will forgive you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that in another hadith Qudsi that I will forgive anyone as long as they ask the forgiveness. There are many hadith that speaks about the forgiveness of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah Azza wa loves to forgive. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala welcomes the tawbah of people at night for the things that they commit during the day. And he welcomes the tawbah during the day for the people who have committed sins during the night. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's so many sa'a. There's a hadith that said there's every day, there is a moment in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives everyone. And there's certain exceptions for certain sins. So seek the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's so many hadith about it. So Allah azza wa jalla again is encouraging people to seek his Forgiveness and forgiveness here or, or istighfar in this particular context includes tawbah. Tawbah and istighfar mean the same thing when they are used generally. It's like the word miskin and fuqara. Faqir and miskin mean the same thing when they are used separately or in general when you're not using them in a very particular technical sense. They mean the exact same thing. But when you use them together, then they have a different meaning. Or when you use them in a particular technical sense, like in fiqh, then they mean something specific. So, same thing for tawbah and istighfar. So generally, these words replace one another. Tawbu ilallah and istaghfirullah mean the same thing generally. However, if you use them in the same sentence or in particular context, then is when the meaning differs. So in general, tawbah and istighfar means turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to seek forgiveness for a sin, hoping not to be punished for that sin. Both words mean the exact same thing in that regard. But the technical difference, when we say there's a difference between tawbah and istighfar, the difference 
between them technically is that tawbah involves expiation while istighfar does not. This is the first difference. That tawbah, in order for tawbah to be valid in the dunya, because tawbah is wajib. And like every other wajib thing, thing, in order for it to be valid in the dunya, all of the conditions and all of the arkan must be fulfilled. Like salah and so otherwise it must be repeated. So if somebody says, I made tawbah, we say, okay, tawbah has conditions. Did you fulfill the conditions? Yeah. So tawbah involve expiation. Because a sin can be either a violation of the right of Allah Azza wa Jal only or the rights of human beings. And the rights of human beings can be rights that relate to their property or to their, to their person, yani themselves, or to their honor. And part of the tawbah is to fix those aspects. If you've damaged property or stolen property, you say, oh Allah, forgive me. That only fixes the part that is between you and Allah, which is you disobeyed Allah Azza wa But the tawbah is not complete. So the istighfar is complete if somebody raises hands. Raises hands just simply, you don't have to raise your hand. If somebody asks Allah Azza wa to forgive me, that is istighfar. So somebody says, oh, I've done istighfar for that sin. Yes, but have you done tawbah? No. Because part of the tawbah is to return the property. If you've damaged it, to replace the thing. So, and so on. Same thing with if you've committed murder and the matter reached the court and you ran away so that you won't be taken to court and you made you know, ask Allah to forgive you. That might be accepted. That is istighfar. Did you make tawbah? No. You, how do you make tawbah? You have to show up. Show up in court and then see what happens. The family will forgive you and you have to pay the blood money, or you have to do, go through the punishment, which is life for a life. So, tawbah involves expiation, while istighfar does not. That's one difference. Another difference is that tawbah must be preceded by a sin. There must be a sin from which you are making tawbah. Istighfar you don't have to have a sin to do istighfar. So many of the ulama would explain the istighfar of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in this way. You don't have to commit a sin to do istighfar. Allah azza wa jalla said, "Make istighfar," and I'm making istighfar. Tawbah. There must be a sin that you're making tawbah from. Which means another difference is that tawbah has to be related to the past. Because if a sin must precede tawbah, then tawbah is for the past. We've already... But istighfar can also be for the future. So, I ask, after the salah or in the salah, it is recommended, one of the duas that are recommended is to say, uh, to make istighfar, lima taqaddama wa ma, yani ma, what I've committed in the past and what I will commit in the future. This is why the ahadith that relate to forgiveness, for example, fasting on Yawm Arafah, uh, on Yawm Arafah or Ashura, or some of the ahadith that talk about fasting in Ramadan and standing the nights, uh, some of the ahadith say, وَمَا تَأَخَّر but the word used in those ahadith is ghufira because istighfar can be for the future and for the past. Tawbah is only for the past. One of the difference mentioned by Al Imam Al Qarafi, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, in Al Furuq is that Tawbah is ruju' while istighfar is mufaraqa. What this means is that tawbah is ruju'ah, mean tawbah is uprooting the sin from the heart. Where you're, you don't want to go back to that sin. It's trying to remove 
the impulse to commit that sin from your heart completely. It is not there anymore. While istighfar is mufaraqa. Istighfar is in the moment I stop doing that sin. You may return to it 10 minutes later. Tawbah is that effort to completely remove the impulse to commit that sin from the from the heart. Another meaning of or another way in which we see the meaning of Al-Qarafi statement where Tawbah is Rujua and Istighfar is Mufaraqa is if somebody is in a sin they're doing it currently they're there let's say for example somebody goes with some friends to a place that they should not be and they're listening to things that they cannot listen to cannot meaning not supposed to and they're seeing things that they can and they feel bad right there and then but they somehow either cannot come out of the situation or they don't have the strength to deal with the peer pressure so they give in to the peer pressure but they know it's wrong i shouldn't be here and they feel that Tawbah, if somebody says I want to make Tawbah for this sin, you first have to leave that place. You have to stop listening to what you can't, stop looking at what you can't look at, remove yourself from the place of ma'siyah, then you can make Tawbah. But istighfar, you can make while you're there. So they're still in the place, the person feels bad, Allah means astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. This is a valid istighfar but not a valid tawbah. So istighfar meaning he's trying to do mufaraqa. He's trying to get out of that state. Circumstantially, he's still in the sin, but in the heart, he's, he's out of the hal of doing ma'asiyah. He doesn't want to be there anymore. But tawbah, you have to completely move it. So tawbah is trying to remove that impulse completely. This is why uh, Imam al-Junaid al-Baghdadi rahimahullah ta'ala he said that tawbah is nisyan al there are several meanings to that statement one of the meaning is that the impulse to do that sin is gone yani you don't even know how to commit that sin anymore the, in other words you know how the synapses made in the brain the more you do something the deeper that mark in the brain is made that creates a pattern for that behavior. And then when you stop doing certain things, those patterns made in the brain eventually go away, disappear. This is yani nisyanul ma'siyah. You stop doing it so much that the patterns in the brain that create the impulse to do it no longer exists. So tawbah is uprooting while istighfar is just momentarily desisting. Um, Tawbah, another difference is that Tawbah involves a strong commitment which is an azam, a strong decision never to return to the sin and to do the opposite so to replace that sin with the opposite while istighfar, any azam a strong decision never to go back to the sin is not a condition for the validity of istighfar. So it's a validity, it's a condition for the validity of tawbah, but not a, a condition for the validity of istighfar. So in this statement in the hadith Qudsi, wa ana aghfiru dhunuba jami'a refers to both tawbah and istighfar. فَاسْتَغْفِرُونِي مِنْ إِسْتَغْفِرُونِي وَتُوبُوا إِلَيْهِ So, make istighfar and I will aghfir lakum. And I will forgive you. And then the ulama differ what is the meaning of aghfir lakum. Does it mean that the sin is there but it will be mastur, it will be covered. It's in the records but nobody will see it. On the day of judgment, Nobody will see it. It will be as if you haven't committed that sin. 
or does it mean it's completely expunged from the records? It's not even there. If somebody were to look into the records, they cannot see it. This is a difference of opinion among the ulama. And then the hadith Qudsi continues. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam reported, Ya ibadi, O my servants, Lan tablughu durri fatadurruni, wa lan tablughu naf'i fatanfa'uni. O my servants, you would never reach me in order to harm me. And you would never reach me with anything that is beneficial to me to give me any benefit. In other words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that your shirk for the people who commit shirk and your kufr and your ma'asiyah does nothing to me. And your ibadah and your obedience also doesn't do anything to me. Neither case, kufr and ma'asiyah or iman and ta'a, none of this in either benefits or harms Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So don't think that you're doing any good for Allah and don't think that you're doing any bad to Allah. It's just, it's impossible. Ya ibadi, O oh my servants, لو أن أولكم وآخركم وإنسكم وجنكم كانوا على أتقى قلب رجل واحد منكم ما زاد ذلك في ملكي شيئا O oh, my servants, if all of you those who came early and those who came late and those who will be in the end and those who were there at the beginning whether men or jinn if all of them were like the most pious of them, meaning people in their piety are different levels. If all of you were like the most pious among you, if everybody was like the Prophet wasallam, that would not increase in my mulk, in my meaning, Allah speaking, in his kingdom or majesty in any way and if all of you in the same way if all of you were like the worst of you the worst mushrik then then that would not take away anything from the majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is just emphasizing the previous point of shirk does not harm Allah and ta'a does not benefit Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he continued, he said, وَلَوْ أَنَّ أَوَّلَكُمْ وَآخِرَكُمْ وَإِنْسَكُمْ وَجِنَّكُمْ قَامُوا فِي صَعِيدٍ وَاحِدٍ فَسَأَلُونِي فَأَعْطَيْتُ كُلَّ وَاحِدٍ مَسْأَلَتَهُ ما نقص ذلك مما عندي إلا كما ينقص المخيط أو المخيط إذا أدخل البحر. So then Allah Subhanahu wa Taala continued. He said, "O oh my servants of all of you, the first among you and the last of you, and the jinns among you and the men among you, if all of you were to stand." in one gathering place and make dua this stand in one gathering place is not necessary it's just to make people imagine or to picture a lot of people in a single place just so that they get an idea of a lot of people asking for something like Arafah or Hajj or one of these gatherings where everybody is making dua so it's just something to, to capture the imagination of the listener, but it means if all of you were to ask, wherever you are, to ask of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He said, if I gave every one of you exactly what you asked for, 
that would not decrease in my yani what I have except what if you were to take a needle and put it in the ocean and lift it up the water that remains on the needle in comparison to the ocean except that amount now this is not an analogy that is supposed to be exact because in reality it takes nothing away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while in this analogy it does take away something so it's not to say is exactly this is taqribi not tahqiqi this example is what we call taqribi is to give people something from their own experience that they can relate to the concept of nothingness might be difficult for some people to understand. So if you're addressing a whole lot of people where you suspect some of them may not grasp a concept, then you give them the nearest thing that they can experience, that they can understand. So in reality, what the statement means is it takes away nothing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not even the amount that will remain on the needle if you were to put it in the ocean but this analogy is like the kun fayakun example or analogy that is in the Quran that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills for something to happen he says kun fayakun he says be and it is this is just an example for people to imagine that you're saying be and right away something comes into existence. But in reality, Allah Azza wa does not say be. There's no statement. Like Allah, kun fayakun doesn't mean that Allah says anything. Because there's no relationship, no causal relationship between speech and existence or non-existence. In kalam, in the science of, of Theology, we say there is no ta'alluq between i'dam and ijad and kalam. There is no causal relationship between speech and the doing of something, causing something to exist or something not to exist. Existence, causing something to exist or to cease existing يتعلق, in Kalam we say يتعلق بالإرادة والقدرة it, it is connected to the will and the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but kun goes back to which sifa of Allah to the sifa, the quality of speech not the quality of qudra or irada so it doesn't mean that Allah says anything it just means it happens right away so it's just for people to understand that idea of Allah wants it and it comes. Some of the ulama say it's an analogy of, yani of Allah Azza wa Jal, the, the, the king of the heavens and the earth to the kings of the earth. Whereby if they want something, they just instruct it and it happens. So if Allah wants something, he just make it happen. So that's what it means. So that analogy of his, him saying kun, is just taqribi to give you an idea of how immediate it happens but in reality it doesn't even last between Allah Azza wa wanting something and it happening it doesn't even last the amount of time that it will take for somebody to say kun it's just the idea of how fast it happens and there's nothing that obstructs it it's just he wants it it is so same thing in this example there's a slight amount of water being removed from the ocean but compared to the ocean is nothing but in reality what is meant is nothing it takes away nothing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then he said ya ibadi O oh my servants innama hiya a'malukum uhsiha lakum thumma uwafiyakum iyaha all of this if your ta'a doesn't benefit Allah, your obedience doesn't benefit Allah, and your sins do not harm Allah, then why are they there? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, these are a'mal that He counts for you and that He will give you your reward. 
This is so that there's a system of judgment. Nobody can claim on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Nobody can claim that I am going to Jahannam for no reason. No, we have a record. You did this. These were your choices. These were your actions. So people can see exactly. There's a hujaj. This is why they're called hujaj. There are evidences for or against you on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. لِكَيْ لَا يَكُونَ عَلَى اللَّهِ so that people cannot have any claims on Yawm Al-Qiyamah against Allah. Everything will be seen in, in measure. So this is just for the measuring of that. that these are a'mal, these are the choices that you've made and this is why you are receiving what you are receiving. So in the mahiyya a'malukum. These are your actions that are preserved for you. And that Allah will give you exactly what these actions are worth. Meaning, on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, there is ziyada. There is extra that people are going to be given. And people are going to be forgiven for things. But, the original measures will be clear to everyone. People did this and they're going to be rewarded or it deserves this reward, but they're going to receive far more. But this equals to this will be clearly seen. People will be punished. This necessitates this. That will be clearly seen, but I'm going to forgive half of it or give less. Than. But you know, the wafa will be seen. So... These are your a'mal uwafiyannakum iyaha that you will be compensated for. Now the compensation can happen in the dunya and in the akhirah. Compensation for your actions are given both in dunya and in the akhirah. So the Muslims, because of their sayyat, they get punished in the dunya. And because of their hasanat, they re re receive a higher place in the akhirah. For their bad deeds, they may suffer a bit in the dunya. And for their good deeds, they will be given rewards in the akhirah. And the non-Muslims, because of their sayyat, will be punished in the akhirah. But because of their hasanat, they will be given something in the dunya. The non-Muslims will receive rewards for their good deeds in this world, but they will be punished in the akhirah for their sayyat. And, and the worst sayyat is, Shirk and Kufr. And so because of that, the punishment will be severe in the Akhirah. When we say that non-Muslims will receive con compensation for hasanat in the dunya, we're talking about hasanat in which Islam and Iman is not a condition for its validity. Any good deed where being Muslim is a condition for its validity, then they will not receive any reward. If a non-Muslim, for example, makes wudu and go to salah, this is not rewarded in the dunya or the akhirah because this is not a good deed. Why it's invalid? Why is it invalid? Because niya is a rukun, and one of the conditions of niya is Islam. So it wasn't valid. But feeding the poor, Islam is not a condition. You will be rewarded for that in the dunya. Taking care of the orphans, building things to make life easy for people. All of this you will be compensated for in the dunya. The compensation can be many, the respect of other people, money, you make money off of a lot of things that you do, recognition or ease. A lot of your burdens might be eased for you in the dunya. Punishment can be decreased for you in the grave. This is all possible. We know that Abu Lahab, his punishment is reduced every Monday because of the happiness he felt for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he was born. So your punishment may be decreased even in the grave. In the akhirah, meaning after the grave. We know that the grave begins your akhirah. But akhirah here I mean Yom Al-Qiyamah and beyond. Then they will receive punishment for their sayyat. So, يعني, you will receive compensation for your actions. فَمَنْ وَجَدَ خَيْرًا فَلْيَحْمَدِ اللَّهِ Whoever finds good, then be grateful to Allah This can refer only to the Akhirah. 
This statement, فَمَنْ وَجَدَ خَيْرًا فَلْيَحْمَدِ اللَّهِ According to some of the ulama, this is for the akhirah. This is referring to the akhirah. Whoever finds khair, whoever finds good, meaning whoever finds that he's in jannah, فَلْيَحْمَدِ اللَّهِ Then, praise Allah. And, and this praising of Allah Azza wa Jal was already reported to us in the Qur'an that the people of Jannah will say Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Now some of the ulama say that it also refers to the dunya. Meaning after all of, of what is preceded, all that has preceded in this hadith, Allah Azza wa Jal is now telling people, if you find khair in the dunya, فَلْيَحْمَدِ Then praise Allah Azza wa Jal. Now, with that interpretation, khair in the dunya refers to two things. There are two interpretations of the word khair if we interpret the sentence to be in reference to the dunya. The first is if you find that ta'a is easy. فَمَنْ وَجَدَ خَيْرًا Whoever finds good, meaning whoever finds that it is easy to do good deeds, فَلْيَحْمَدِ اللَّهِ Then praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because khair in the dunya is the ability to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is khair. And everything that we have in the dunya, if it leads to the worship of Allah, then it's khair. But if it leads to the disobedience of Allah, then it's not khair, no matter how good it seems in the dunya. If you have a lot of money and ease and health and you have all of that, but it's to the service of ma'asiyah, then the ma'asiyah, the sins, is itself bad, and the things that support it is bad. The money that you use is bad for you. It's, it's na'ma but not ni'ma. It's na'matun means the, out, the outer appearance seems good and glamorous but the inside is bad because it leads you to what is bad. So khair in the dunya is if you have the ability to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَمَنْ وَجَدَ خيرا. If you find it easy to do ta'a فَلْيَحْمَدِ اللَّهِ Praise Allah Azza wa Jalla. In other words, don't think, oh, I'm good. Because then that means you're not good. If somebody is like fasting, oh, I'm better than all the people who didn't fast, then that might erase all the rewards of the fast. So don't, that's what we say, if you find the khair, if you find that you are among the people who find ta'a easy, then don't praise the self. Don't think, oh, I'm good. فَلْيَحْمَدِ who deserves the praise for that? Not you, Allah. It's just a reminder. If you find good, you have to praise. It's praiseworthy. If you find that your, your behavior is praiseworthy, who deserves that praise? Not you, Allah. فَلْيَحْمَدِ According to others, فَمَنْ وَجَدَ خَيْرًا means two things. You, you have what other people define as a good life, but you're using it in ta'ah. If you find that you have health, and you have wealth, and you have ease, you have children, and you have what everybody calls a good life, if you have that plus ta'ah, فَلْيَحْمَدِلَّهِ But if you find that you have that, in what other people define as a good life, but you don't have ta'ah, then istaghfirillah, then make istighfar. Because that's a bad state to, to be in. So, man wajada khaira, whoever finds goodness, meaning ta'a. Or, that's if we interpret khair in this context, strictly according to the, yani the worldview of the akhirah. Because in the worldview of the akhirah, khair can only mean ta'a. If we interpret khair to refer to, yani, what other people generally think about a good life, yani which is to have ease and wealth and all of that type of thing, good health, then, and, and you have ta'a along with it, فَلْيَحْمَدِلَّهِ And these two interpretations of khair is what is in the interpretation of the ayah, uh, مَنْ عَمِلَ صَالِحًا مِنْ ذَكَرٍ أُنْثَى وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٌ فَلَنُحْيَنَّهُمْ حَيَاةً طَيِّبَةً Whoever, men or women, whoever uh, does righteous deeds, we will give them a good life. The ulama, what is good life in that ayah? Good life means we'll make it easy for them to do ta'a. 
or it means we'll give them a good line, what generally people call a good line. We'll give them good health, give them good wealth, and along with that, we'll give them the ability to do ta'a. So, فَلْيَحْمَدِ وَمَنْ وَجَدَ غَيْرَ ذَلِكَ فَلَا يَلُومَنَّا إِلَّا نَفْسَهِ And whoever finds other than that, then let him not blame except himself. Meaning, again, if we interpret it to be the Akhirah, whoever finds himself in Jahannam, in the Akhirah, may Allah protect us, then only blame yourself. Or, if we interpret this sentence in the context of dunya, whoever in the dunya finds other than khair. Now, the, in the statement, khair is mentioned explicitly. Man wajada khaira, if you find goodness, falyahmadillah, then praise Allah. But sharr is not mentioned explicitly. He said, well, and whoever finds other than that, other than goodness, to emphasize that how f- far removed the believer should be from sharr, that we're not even going to say it. We avoid sharr, we avoid wickedness so much that when we speak about it, we won't even mention it by name. We'll avoid mentioning it. That's how much we do ijtinab of sharr. And that's emphasized in this, the wordings of the hadith, Qudsi. Which is from the adab of the believer. From the adab of a believer is not to speak about wickedness. Not to say that which is wicked. Yani it is makruh, according to the Shafi'i madhab, it is makruh to yani, have what is called fuhsh, which is lowly speech. It is generally to sit and talk about lowly things is makruh, according to the Shafi'i madhab. Except if it's necessary. Except when? When it is needed, that's the only time it doesn't become makruh. So if we need, for example, one, one example of need is if you need fatwa. You need to describe something, but it's like generally you won't, it's, it's not proper to speak about, but the only way you can get a fatwa is if you clearly say what you mean, then you have to say it and it's not makruh. In fact, it's mustahab. And if the answer depends on it, then it's wajib. If you need that answer in order to avoid that bad thing. Or another way in which it is, it is not makruh is if somebody is trying to teach something and the only way they can get the point across is by using bad language and it's not makruh. It's mustahab or wajib to use bad speech. If there's a conflict between people understanding what you have to say and speaking in a lowly way, if there's a conflict between In other words, if I maintain the adab and not speak bad, people will not understand. If I speak bad, they will understand. Then according to the sharia, it is mustahab to speak in a bad way. Because communicating the message is more important than the adab of not speak, giving bad speech. But in general, it is makruh. It is makruh to even speak about the bad things that you've done, even if it's not haram. It's makruh, lowly things. I want to give examples, but I want to... And okay. to to talk about the lowly things that you've done that are not haram is also makru because we're not supposed to be involved in lowly, bad speech. So even mentioning the thing, even something that there's, there's a, an activity, for example, whereby there's halal of it and haram of it. And people are accustomed to speaking about it in the haram context. Even mentioning the name is makruh. So this is why there are a lot of uh, metaphors in the language of the Prophet wasallam that refers to sexual intercourse. You wouldn't even say the word. Because why? The lowly people, when they gather, there's something that they speak about in a low way. So we won't even speak about it mention it by name even when we're talking about it in good context. This is why there's so many metaphors for it and, and so on. So here 
the word khair is explicitly mentioned, but the word shar is not, to emphasize that yani, how much we stay away from shar, even mentioning by name is something that we would stay away from. For وَمَنْ وَجَدَ غَيْرَ ذَلِكَ Whoever finds other than that, فَلَا يَلُمُنَّ إِلَّا نَفْسَهِ Then let him not blame except himself because Allah gave you in your constitution, Allah made within the constitution of man something called choice. And in order for that to be real, he will create your choices. If Allah didn't create what you chose, then you didn't really have choice. You're really compelled, but people are telling you you have choice. Or, or you're told that you have choice. But in order for choice to be real, Allah has to create. When you choose it, it's created, then you know that it's a real choice. So Allah gave you the ability to choose, and you chose what you chose, so you have to blame yourself. And then that's the end of that uh, hadith. You go on to the 25th hadith. So al hadith al khamis wal ishroon al imam al nawawi rahimahullah subhanahu wa ta'ala narrated also through an unbroken chain to Abi Dhar al Ghifari radiallahu ta'ala anhu arta anna nasan min ashabi rasulillah or min ashabi al nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qalu lin nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ya rasulallah ذهب أهل الدثور بالأجور يصلون كما نصلي ويصومون كما نصوم ويتصدقون بفضول أموالهم قال أوليس قد جعل الله لكم ما, يت... ما تصدقون إن بكل تسبيحة صدقة وكل تدبيرة صدقة وكل تحميدة صدقة وكل تهليلة صدقة وأمر بالمعروف صدقة ونهي عن منكر صدقة وفي بضع أحدكم صدقة قالوا يا رسول الله أيأتي أحدنا شهوته ويكون له فيها أجر قال أرأيتم لو وضعها في حرام أكان عليه فيها وزر فَكَذَلِكَ إِذَا وَضَعَهَا فِي الْحَلَالِ كَانَ لَهُ أَجْرٌ رَوَاهُ مُسْلِمٌ So, on the authority of Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, رضي الله عنه, said, some people came يعني, from the ashab of the Prophet, some people from the companions of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم came to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and they said, O Messenger of Allah, the rich people take all of the rewards. They pray like we pray, fast like we fast, give zakah like we give zakah, uh, sorry, give charity with, with their extra wealth. The Prophet ﷺ said, didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you anything that you can give sadaqah with? And then he informed them, Every tasbiha, يعني every time you say subhanallah, it's a sadaqah. And every time you say Allahu Akbar, it's a sadaqah. And every time you say alhamdulillah, it's a sadaqah. And every time you say la ilaha illallah, it's a sadaqah. And every time you command that which is good and forbid that which is evil, it's a sadaqah. Even concerning the private parts of your spouse, there's a sadaqah. And then they said, Ya Rasulullah, one of us takes care of our shahwa, of our desire, and we get reward for that. The Prophet ﷺ said, do you not see that if somebody does that in a way that is haram, he will be sin? In the same way, if he does that in a way that is halal, he receives a reward. So, some of the companions came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Here the word Ashab is used as a plural for the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 
And this is a Lughawi usage. It's where we borrow a plural from the language to refer to something specific in the religion. But the plural in the language itself won't work. Because Sahaba is already plural. Sahaba is the plural for Sahabi. So the singular of Sahaba is Sahabi. The, the singular of Ashab is Sahib. Not Sahabi. But yani, this is called Tasamuh. It's a linguistic laxity that we have. In other words, it's not a problem. So Ashab Rasulillah is the same as Sahaba and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So some of the companions came. Some of the narrations say that some of the companions from the Ansar came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. These are the poor. Some narrations say were some of the poor from the Arab. Yani there are difference of yani who Nas referred to in the hadith. Some people came to the Prophet ﷺ and they complained. They said, Ya Rasulullah, the rich people take all of the rewards. Now, when they're complaining here, they're not complaining out of jealousy. They're not complaining because they want to be any for others not to be rich this is not why they're complaining they're complaining because they feel that we're losing out from the rewards that other people are gaming, gaining simply because we are not as rich as them in that way they're equivalent to the people who complained or who about the same thing the quran in surah tawbah gave the story of what in the Sira literature, the tafsir literature, they are referred to as the Bakka'un. Bakka'un means those who cried, literally, or the criers. Specifically referring, this term Bakka'un refers specifically to seven of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, who came when the Prophet ﷺ and the army were going out to fight. They couldn't afford the weapons and they couldn't afford the transportation. They didn't have horses or camels and they didn't have weaponry. And the munafiqun came and they made excuses not to go. And some people who had genuine excuses came and gave their excuses why they couldn't go. Old people, some of them were old, some of them were sick. But then seven of them came and asked the Prophet ﷺ to take them. They didn't come with an excuse not to go. They came to ask for them to be taken because they didn't have their own equipment. Can you take us with you? Provide equipment for us. So the Quran says, وَلَا عَلَى الَّذِينَ إِذَا مَا أَتَوْكَ لِتَحْمِلَهُمْ Those who came to you for you to provide transportation for them. قُلْتَ لَا أَجِدُ مَا أَحْمِلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam responded, he said, I... I don't have anything to take you with. You know, I cannot find extra horses and equipment to provide for you. They went away crying. So this is why they're called the Bakka'un, the, the ones who cried. So they went away crying. They went away crying. Saddened by the fact that they couldn't find the money to spend. So this, these were complaining about the same thing that these in this hadith are complaining about. Allah yajidu ma yunfiqun That they cannot find the money to spend. So it's a sadness, the Qur'an. The whole point of all of that was to say that the Qur'an described this feeling that they had as hazan. Not hasad. Hazanan. Allah yajidu. They were saddened that they couldn't find what to spend, but they didn't have any hasad or any rancor. There is no negative feeling involved in this except hazan. So this is something that the Quran described as hazan. Hazan and Allah yajidu ma yunfiqun. They were sad that they didn't have the money to spend. So they told the Prophet وسلم, that the rich people are able to take all of this reward. They do what we do, meaning they can pray like we can pray, and they fast like we fast, 
and they give sadaqah, not only zakah, but they give sadaqah bifuduli amwalihim. Now this is something the companions understood because they're talking about ujur. Zahaba ahlud dusur bil ujur. And then when they talk about sadaqah, they say bifuduli amwalihim. When the Sahaba understood that sadaqah is only rewardable if it is min fudul al amwal, if it is from extra money. If somebody doesn't have extra money to give, then giving sadaqah is either makruh or haram. And obviously, if it's makruh or haram, it's not rewardable. So, this hadith can be used as evidence. For those who say that it is makruh or haram to give money that is not extra money. If you, if you have debts, you have people to take care of, then if you give sadaqah, it is makruh if they and you are willing to suffer the loss of that money. Then it's makruh. So if you talk to your dependents and say that I'm going to give sadaqah, but that means... I won't be able to provide X, Y, Z, and they're okay with that, and you're okay with that, then it's makruh. It's not haram. It's makruh because you might be tempted later to regret that decision. And to regret doing something that is khair is not good. It's not a good place to be in. So because you can regret doing something for Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, we say it's makruh. Because we don't want you to regret doing something lillah. But if you're not willing to suffer, or you are, but your dependents are not. If they have to suffer, you can't provide for your family the way you must, be, according to Sharia. You can't pay your debts because you're giving sadaqah, then that sadaqah becomes haram. Because now you are leaving off a wajib for something that is not wajib. But the Sahaba, they understood that. And they said, بِفُضُولِ أَمْوَالِهِمْ They uh, give Sadaqa with their extra money. In other words, it's rewardable. This is why I say Adduthuru bil ujur. People may ask, how about Abu Bakr as Siddiq? He gave all of his money. You say, well, he gave it knowing that him and his family were willing to go and he sacrificed whatever it took not having that money. So it may fall in the category that the Shafi'i Madhab say is makruh. Now, how do we deal with that? Like the same question from the last class. There's a Sahabi, one of the, the best person after the Anbiya And we're saying that what he did is According to your madhab not, not what Abu Bakr did The action referred to is makru according to your madhab We say well there are many things that are makru according to the madhab And we base the fact that it's makru on a hadith that show that it was done Now the reason we say it's makru is because a hadith proved that it was done this is common in fiqh. In other words, if there wasn't a hadith that showed that it was done, we would say it's haram. But because a hadith showed that it was done, we now downgraded it to karaha. And how do we interpret the hadith? We say the hadith was done bayanan lil jawaz to show that it is permissible, not haram. There are many things that are makruh that the Prophet ﷺ himself did or approved of in this case of Abu Bakr we're talking about, he approved of it. He either did or approved of simply the bayan al-jawaz, just to show that it's permissible, you know, it's not haram, but it's not the best thing to do. How do we know it's not the best thing to do? Many other ahadith approves the opposite. So how do we, in a case like that, where there are many ahadith approves the opposite, and then we find one or two cases in which it was done by the Prophet Sallallahu or approved of by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam we interpret those singular hadith the instances in which it was done as being done to show that it's permissible but should not be done so in this case we say he approved of it to show that it's permissible but all of the other ahadith that shows that you shouldn't do it those are the norm but he approved it so we say this one is little jawaz he permitted it so he showed that it's permissible. And karaha falls under what category of actions? Jawaz. 
Something makru is something that is permissible. It's not haram, it's not prohibited, but it should not be done. So that's one way of interpreting the, the action of Abu Bakr Siddiq. The other way is to say it's an exception. The Prophet ﷺ approved of it for Abu Bakr Siddiq. That's it, because he knew who Abu Bakr Siddiq was. So if you find in the Sunnah where the Prophet ﷺ approved of something for one companion, but stopped everybody else from doing it, then we say that that's an exception. He made an exception for that one particular case or that one particular person. So this is a second interpretation of the uh, hadith of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq The more or the strongest interpretation is the first one, that it was done by Anil al Jawais. It was done in order to show its permissibility. So, bifuduli amwalihim. They give their extra money in sadaqah. And then the Prophet Sallallahu said to them, أَوَلَيْسَ قَدْ جَعَلَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ مَا تَصَدَّقُونَ Didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you anything that you can use in sadaqah? In other words, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is informing the companions that sadaqah is not strictly about wealth. It's not about money. It's about resources. Sadaqah is not only about money. And sadaqah is not only giving to others. So these are two things being communicated to the companions about the meaning of sadaqah. A. Sadaqah is not restricted to money. B. Sadaqah doesn't always have to involve a recipient other than yourself. Sadaqah can be to yourself. So, Sadaqah can be either maliyah or ghayr maliyah. Maliyah means it involves money or ghayr maliyah can be is other than money. And other than money can be that which is received by others and that which is not received by others. So if you were to draw like a flow chart of sadaqah, you have sadaqah can be related to wealth, can be other than wealth. And then other than wealth can be that which involves a recipient or that which does not involve a recipient meaning a, a separate person other than the self. So sadaqah that doesn't involve money, but it does involve a recipient can be things like amr bil ma'roof, commanding that which is good, prohibiting that which is evil. That's a sadaqah. It can involve ta'leem al-ilm, to teach somebody something. That is sadaqah. It doesn't involve money. Teaching somebody Qur'an, how to recite the Qur'an or to teach them a surah that they can memorize, this is sadaqah. It involves a recipient but it doesn't involve money. Or removing something dangerous from any place. The example of the sunnah is to remove it from the roadways. It can be removing it from the internet. It can be removing it from somebody's phone. It can be anything, just removing that which is Harmful. Dua for Muslims, that's sadaqah, that doesn't involve money. Making istighfar for people, asking Allah to forgive people is sadaqah, it doesn't involve money. To do something that will benefit people, only for the benefit of people, it wasn't for your own benefit. It can even be, for example, in a class, you know something, but you ask the question, though you know the answer because you want other people to hear, that is for their benefit. That can be a sadaqah. It doesn't involve money. Um, to withhold your own badness so that other people don't have to suffer from it. That's a sadaqah. You feel angry, you want to shout. But the other people have to hear you shout. To not shout, that's a sadaqah to everybody who can hear you behave bad. So that type of thing. 
to, to be loud and to behave in a way that to restrain that behavior of sadaqah to everybody else. To wear perfume so that other people can smell a good smell. Or at least for men in public, for women, no. But at least removing your bad smells, that's sadaqah. Brushing your teeth before you go to the masjid is sadaqah to everybody who would otherwise have to smell your bad breath. Or taking a bath is sadaqah. So if somebody just bathes before they go to some place and their intention is other people don't have to smell me, this is sadaqah. You don't have to spend money to do sadaqah. So all of this is sadaqah. Idhal is surur. To make people happy is sadaqah. You see somebody is a bit sad to make them happy, cheer them up is Sadaqah. All of the examples that I just mentioned are examples mentioned in specific ahadith. Where the Prophet ﷺ described all of those things that I just mentioned with the word sadaqah. And he called each one of these things sadaqah. But in general, good deeds are sadaqah. In a hadith collected by Imam Muslim, he said, Kullu ma'roofin sadaqah. Every good deed is sadaqah. Non-wealth sadaqah, any sadaqah that does not involve wealth, but doesn't have a separate recipient, would be things like making dhikr. It's a sadaqah to yourself. Or making istighfar is for your own sins is a sadaqah to yourself. Or going to the masjid. Every time you walk to the masjid, it's a sadaqah to yourself. These again have been described in various ahadith with the word sadaqah, where the Prophet wasallam described them as being sadaqah to yourself. An argument could be made that there are recipients but not seen. In the world, the spiritual world, are the recipients of your istighfar and dhikr and going to the masajid. Um, We'll have to stop here. We'll continue in the next session, inshallah ta'ala. Hada wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.